and publicly owned and uh, de democratically controlled renewable energy. Before joining the St. Energy Project, he led uh, the Sarah Hanna Sresta's um, victorious New York State Assembly campaign in the Mid-Hudson Valley, which helped place the Public Renewables Act at the center of the Albany climate agenda. He has also served as a lead organizer and strategist for the Public Power New York Coalition in New York City. Um, so thank you both for being here and I will kick it to Kim. Great, thank you so much. Um, hi everybody, um, thank you for inviting us here. Um, first, I just wanted to sort of start off explaining a little bit of who St. Energy Project is. We um, uh, started in 2011 during Occupy Wall Street to fight a major fracked gas pipeline that was one of the first high pressure, high volume fracked gas pipelines connecting the new uh, high volume fracking fields in Pennsylvania directly with New York City. And that was under the instruction of former Mayor Michael Bloomberg, who was heavily invested in the fracking industry at the time. Um, so we moved from oil boilers to gas boilers because it was apparently a transition fuel instead of moving right to renewables. So St. Energy really dug into that fight and really got went down a rabbit hole with understanding the comprehensive uh, view of the fracking industry um, from pipelines, compressor stations, waste dumps, water theft, power plants, LNG ports, um, and everything that goes into the entire fracking industry that isn't just drilling. Um, and uh, then um, you can go, oh, we are at the next slide, great. Um, and then uh, when we dug into that fight, uh, around 2017, we were, we were fighting um, a massive fracked gas pipeline leak going from Pennsylvania through New Jersey and under the New York Harbor called the Williams Nessie pipeline. Um, and with that, we realized that the corporate utility national grid, which served gas to downstate New York, was their sole customer. And we started sort of digging into that and found that this corporate corporation that we are all connected to every month through the, a mail bill to our homes um, were our direct connection to the fossil fuel fight. Um, you can go on to the next slide. And uh, I made a little video, St. Energy Project made a little video um, about how the corporate utilities um, are able to uh, ask for more money to build more infrastructure. So they don't make money by selling you gas or selling you electricity. They make more money by building more infrastructure and then charging you a rate of return on that. And that's how our bills go up. But that sort of goes hand in hand with the fossil fuel industry. Um, so you can hit play on the video. In the 1800s, New York City used to light its streets with gas lanterns. As the population grew, so did the number of gas companies looking to corner the market. And since these companies were unregulated, they battled for turf in the streets of Manhattan. These guys who fought these wars were called the Gas House Gangs. The invention of the incandescent bulb in 1879, which marked the dawn of the electric era, changed everything. Gas and electric suppliers competed head to head. To make sense of a growing, increasingly complex grid, utilities were granted monopoly status in order to streamline energy delivery to prevent companies from dueling over control of the grid and to avoid duplicative overlapping infrastructure. What a mess that would be. In exchange for being granted special monopoly status, every utility in New York State is regulated, in most cases by the Public Service Commission. So the Public Service Commission regulates electric and gas companies, along with water and telecoms in New York State and they are in charge of regulating prices of our energy. The corporate utilities have to ask the PSC for permission to raise prices to cover the cost of building and maintaining infrastructure. They also factor in a hefty guaranteed profit for their shareholders. 
This process of asking for money for development of infrastructure opens up a proceeding which is called a rate case. And the rate case process is designed to be very back room and hidden from the public. Right now in New York State, some corporate utilities are asking to expand fossil fuel infrastructure without considering renewable alternatives and make us, the customers, pay for it. Given our climate goals in New York State and climate goals globally to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, this makes no sense. These are big corporations looking to do business as usual when our planet cries out for a rapid transition to renewable energy. Visit saneenergy.org backslash utilities to get active in keeping fossil fuels in the ground. Cool. So good. Oop. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so what we have done is we have, in, in order to sort of fight the corporate utilities in, in the frame of stopping the fossil fuel industry and transitioning us to a just energy system um, that serves all people regardless of income and zip code, is that uh, we have utilized the, the rate cases in New York State um, and we've built campaigns around those, um, outside facing campaigns around those in our communities. Um, and this isn't just New York State. Um, I, a, lot of, a lot of states also have public utility commissions where they, they also fight uh, in rate cases and we've, we've connected with several other states, but we work specifically in New York State. And some of the victories that we've had is we've, they are not used to activists being in these spaces. So when we got in there and we were really fighting, we were able to halt um, two massive liquefied fracked gas vaporizers um, at a 120 acre LNG facility that's just right in my neighborhood here that we're working to shut down. Um, but we were able to defeat those um, last year in 2023. Um, and that was a huge victory for us. And that was because we were able to sort of um, agitate inside a space that isn't used to agitation. And then we've also been working a lot on legislation. Um, one is a uh, utility accountability act um, for um, to make sure that the corporate utilities can't use our money to lobby for their profiteering interests. And also uh, the New York Heat Act, which I think most people, if you're from New York State, you've been involved in this fight if you're a climate activist. Um, and that is ending subsidies for um, the gas industry and capping um, income, uh, capping utility bills at 6% of household income. Um, so there's a lot of ways that we've been fighting inside the regulatory spaces, inside the legislative spaces, and on the streets. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to our associate director, Michael Paulson, to talk about how we're going to build the new world. Thanks, Kim. Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, as, as Kim was saying, um, you know, we're, we're up against a pretty nasty opponent with the corporate utilities, and we will continue taking the fight to them. Um, but uh, another part of the work that we do is really looking ahead to a world where we, we don't have to deal with these utilities, where we can actually have an energy system that is by and for the people, and that is very different from all of the you know nouns and adjectives we saw in the chat about corporations. Um, and so what that means is, is public power. Um, so we're, we're heavily involved in uh, uh, public power campaigning. Um, so I understand you had an earlier session where you uh, heard uh, about the Build Public Renewables Act. Um, so I won't go into much detail there, but just to note that uh, we helped pass that uh, last year and that has um, uh, mandated that New York State start to build up its own publicly owned renewable energy where the private market has failed to do so. Um, and uh, we've found that that is putting pressure on the utilities um, to start transforming. Um, and we had to, in fact, beat back all of the utilities to pass this legislation. So whichever uh, area we're working in, we see that utilities really do not want progress. Um, they have a good thing going in the model that Kim showed in the video where they have a monopoly um, and they have a cash cow, basically. 
um, which just prints money for them. And as Tim was saying, um, the way that they get that money um, is by locking us into more and more of this both costly and dangerous fossil fuel infrastructure. So um, on a fundamental level, their business model is not compatible with our climate goals. Um, so uh, I wanna turn to a new campaign, which is very exciting. Um, and uh, that is the, um, the, actually, if you could go back one, Candice, if you don't mind. Um, that is the, um, the, the image on the right, um, which is the Hudson Valley Power Authority Act. Um, so this was just introduced uh, last week um, here in New York State. And so that is a bill uh, to establish a public power authority that would uh, be able to take over the utility in uh, the Hudson Valley. Any folks here from the Hudson Valley? Um, if you are, you know and do not love Central Hudson, um, and it's 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 it struggles with power outages, completely chaotic billing system uh, with people seeing their bill jump by like. 500%, 1,000% out of nowhere. It's completely wild. Um, they're also, like other utilities, seeking extremely unreasonable rate hikes. Um, they also have a huge number of uh, customers in debt because of their billing systems. So there's a massive public outcry there. Um, and um, I wanted to highlight this because there's, you know, there are a lot of discussions in campaigning around how do we actually move public power forward um, because it is a really tough thing to do. Um, there's a lot of money pushing back against you. So I think this uh, this campaign sort of shows a way by, by looking to target some of the utilities that are the worst actors and the most unpopular. Um, I think we can start to drive a wedge into the for-profit utility model and start winning and start showing um, people that there is another option. Um, and that's going to be a long fight. Um, but I hope people will, will want to get involved in that. Um, so as far as that goes, um, we of course have some next steps and some ways to get involved. Um, so the first I will mention, so uh, Kim mentioned the liquefied natural gas uh, facilities in North Brooklyn. Um, we have a uh, massive and fun and exciting day of action coming up in just a couple of weeks, Sunday, June 2nd. Um, there's, I, I, will, I will not spoil it, but it will involve bikes, it will involve boats, uh, it will involve other fun activities um, that will be good for kids. Um, so uh, we'll have that, the sign up link for that in the chat if you're anywhere around Brooklyn. Um, we also have a petition uh, related to that campaign, which will be in the chat. And if you can sign that, we're, we're still trying to show there is just massive community opposition to this facility that is poisoning uh, the disadvantaged community and, and uh, poisoning the land that has been you know, already badly damaged by fossil fuels for so many years. Um, and lastly, um, if you have a moment, uh, you could sign on to our letter to um, Governor Kathy Hochul, which is uh, encouraging her to fully implement the Build Public Renewables Act. And the new campaign I mentioned is so new that they don't have a call to action for you just yet, but they do have a really cool website um, that you can check out, which will be in, uh, in the chat. Um, so thanks all so much for, for being here. It's great to connect about this and I look forward to, to chatting in Q&A. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kim and Michael. Um, all right. We are going to now pass it over to Bill Reagan. Uh, Bill is a campaigner and organizer with 35 years of experience in the labor movement. At SEIU, he led campaigns that combined direct action with corporate accountability and legal strategies to organize low wage workers. Bill helped win a global organizing agreement with a company that employed half a million workers in over 100 countries. Since then, he has worked to stop electric utilities from burning fossil fuels. Like his union work, Bill's climate work combines grassroots organizing with corporate strategies to build our movement and uh, change corporate behavior. So Bill is going to be talking about um, organizing around an accountability campaign with Warren Buffett's company Berkshire's Hathaway, and I'll pass it to you, Bill. 
Hey there. Um, I'm really glad to be here. It's a good conversation, at least so far. And um, I want to talk a little bit about sort of corporate campaign in theory, and then I want to dig in on our campaign uh, with this Berkshire Hathaway company. Um, so I want to start with a question, like, what should happen to sort of set the stage for why we need to do corporate campaigns? And I encourage people to use the chat a lot, but what should happen when we identify a problem that we face as a society. For example, we learned that burning coal causes climate change, death, and large accumulations of toxic substances. And, you know, feel free to chime in on that chat, but let's, could you give me the next line, please? And the answer is, I think we agree, is we should uh, pass laws and implement regulations to prevent the burning of coal and other fossil fuels. And the next line, please. So my next question is, Who's had that experience lately? Go ahead, put it in the chat. Who's had that experience? Um, I don't, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think we're seeing a lot of like functional um, responses to policy problems. So next question, please. So, you know, what is the cause of this problem? And um, this time I really would like to, well, there was something in the chat about what we're up against, and we sort of touched on it in the beginning of we were putting in our responses to corporations. And um, anyone want, feels like chiming in about what our pro, you know, lobbyists, concentrated power, big money, concentration of power. Absolutely, yeah, more on the big money. So. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem. So let's go to the next slide, please. What are we not done? Yeah, um, so what do we do? Um, <clears throat> good question. Um, next next line, please. So what we do is we fight back, um, and we sort of name this, this big money, and that's the source of that big money is these corporations. And particularly I'm talking about, like, uh, it's hard enough in New York, which you've heard about, but I'm, in my work, focusing on deeply red states where the politics are just, you know, you can't even get people to admit that climate change is a problem, let alone what we should do about it. So if we could have the next line. Um, so these corporations, they're disrupting democracy and they're disrupting the planet. Um, so if we could have the next line and the graphic. Um, so we're going to we're going to disrupt them. I mean, there, there are different kinds of power. There's ideological power. There's financial, you know, money power. We talked about that. Um, there's there's political power, of course, and it helps out some of that. But you know, operating in a space where like not much of that is available. Um, the idea is like we need to disrupt business as usual. We need to like prevent them from you know destroying us by you know, disrupting their disruption. So uh, if we go to the next slide. So let me give you a little background to the um, Clean Up mid am campaign and why this, uh, we decided to do a, uh, a corporate campaign. So Mid-American Energy is owned by Berkshire Hathaway, and it owns six coal-fired plants in the uh, state of Iowa. Next slide. And uh, until recently, mid am has said it had no plans to stop burning coal in um, in Iowa. Um, I, Iowa, as I said, is a deep red state, and there's like really no reasonable prospect of doing normal policy work you know, through the legislature or the governor. So the climate groups there, uh, who've been you know sort of traditional, sort of ideologically centrist groups that just wanted to like prevent climate change, um, have been working on this, and they realized they were just hitting a brick wall. That uh, Again, they're dealing with this Republican carbon death cult, and they needed to try something different. So after a fair amount of debate, um, they said, you know, we need to like, go after this corporation directly. And that was the origins of the um, Clean Up mid am campaign. So let me dig in a little bit about what that looks like and you know, some of the things we're doing. And I want to start by just saying, doesn't mean like we've completely abandoned policy work. I mean, we, we, we're working the legislative session, 
for, you know, trying to elect people. It's like we cannot abandon that work. On the other hand, it's, we can't rely on it either. So let me like start with the um, uh, next, next line, please, on this. And so we, we began by building a broad coalition. As I said, the, the core of this was is some traditional environmental groups concerned about climate change. And some were Iowa-based, some were more national, like Sierra Club's Beyond Coal Campaign. But we expanded out and looked for other groups that maybe climate wasn't their big issue, but they want those coal plants shut down. So it includes like the American Lung Association. Climate is not really their thing, um, but lungs are, and coals, Burning coal is really bad for lungs, so they've participated. Um, a completely different group is the Great Plains Action Society. It's an indigenous-led group, uh, and the reservations got hit with a lot of that coal pollution. Uh, there's sort of a multi-issue group, but definitely the, the health harms from coal is a big deal for them. So we tried to like broaden this out, bring in different groups. And if I could have the, the next line. Um, so the next what we did after we assembled this group is spend some time sort of researching, particularly like who's the decider in this company, you know, who makes the decisions, and power mapping, like who surrounds them, how their world work. And I'm gonna just finish on that point because we're about to hear from a couple of real experts on this stuff. So I just wanna say, we often don't spend enough time figuring out who decides things and how to impact them. You're going to hear from some people about how to do that. We spent a fair amount of time on that before we even got started. So we could have the next line. So as we developed the campaign, we realized we really needed to raise issues that were other than climate. That we had to like find issues that would move people. And you know, a bare majority of folks in Iowa believe that climate change is a human cause and a problem. So we started running on other issues like health impacts. We issued a report uh, on World Asthma Day earlier this month about the impacts of coal burning and the amount of deaths that happen because of these plants. And we not only did a press release and got some media coverage, we're using this report to go to like city council people, to go to different community groups, and to start a conversation with them about how we do this. So we're really trying to like work on that issue because we don't care why people want to close the plants. We just want to make sure they want to close the plants and give them tools to do that. Another issue we've worked on is reliability. I don't know if people remember um, how cold it was in the Midwest in, in January, but it was so cold that the water they used to cool these plants all froze. And so the only reason the light stayed on in Iowa is because of wind power. Um, so it's a great opportunity for us to sort of push back on like, whoa, what happens when the sun goes down and the wind doesn't blow? You can't turn on the lights. Um, we were able to sort of make the case that, hey, um, we, um, we actually can prove that clean energy is both more reliable and less expensive. Um, next one, please. Another thing we've done is I just try to get into their spaces. So Berkshire Hathaway, like most big corporations, has to have an annual shareholders meeting. And we've gone to the last two. Uh, and we had, in both cases, a couple of people go in and ask questions and then a larger demonstration outside. It's kind of interesting. We went last year and uh, this activist high school student asked a climate question and got this really in inane answer uh, from both Buffett and his then number two guy, Charlie Munger. And we really were able to use that to beat up on him. Similar question got asked this time. And, um, you know, got like, a totally inadequate response, but a response that showed movement, or showed at least realization that they've got to um, deal with this issue. And, um, you know, Buffett said, well, you know, it is a problem. We're working on it. It takes time, blah, 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 work, work, work. But, I mean, it's, it shows that they are feeling some kind of heat that they have to take this seriously. Um, and um, we know they don't like this because they're, they're complaining about it, showing up at their spaces, not just the shareholder meeting, but other kind of industry gatherings. Um, next, please. Another thing we've done, and this came out of the research, is like finding regulatory interventions. And sometimes there are things that not necessarily what we absolutely care about, but provide a chance to like just jam up the company. So Midam wanted to do this big development in Iowa. I won't go into details, but it's like this 
tens of millions of dollars investment in, in an energy production facility. And we were able to block it, arguing it's not really what Iowa needs. And it, um, you know, they don't like it when they can't do their project. It costs them money. Their shareholders want to know what's going on. It creates uncertainty. So, you know, we've, we've found an angle and we jammed it. And some of those angles can be pretty far from what our topic is. Um, for example, I said earlier, I organized janitors. In one city, we had a huge fight, strikes, all sorts of stuff went on forever. Finally, what brought the real estate industry, which had been fighting us through the nail to heal, is like we passed some legislation that had to do with how their taxes get assessed. And it drove them crazy. It's not like it wasn't our issue, but by sort of pushing in this really sort of arcane legislation, they threw in the towel and negotiated agreement. So you know, be clever about the regulatory interventions. I mean, we're trying to figure out what we do about these health impacts and what kind of EPA complaint we should do. We definitely want to do that. But there may be other opportunities too, like this real estate thing I was talking about or blocking their expansion plans. Um, next one, please. So the other thing we're trying to do is go big. I mean, we've been like sort of fighting this campaign in Iowa, but as everybody knows, Berkshire Hathaway is a big company and its energy company is in several different states. And we just knew there were people out there dealing with its other entities in places like Wyoming, Utah, Nevada. So we've been um, uh, reaching out to those groups and we used the shareholder meeting to like to create a compression point where people came together. And then we had a strategy call a couple of weeks ago. We'll have another one later this week to talk about how we align um, and how we work together. Because so often when we're dealing with these huge corporations, they're part of even bigger corporations. We're like in our own little you know, space or silo or whatever, and not thinking about all the other people that are fighting this company, maybe about climate, maybe about energy issues, and maybe about something completely different. So we're trying to like, you know, build a coalition here. Um, and then one last thing, um, one last, last line here is um, just sort of constant communication. Um, We've done a lot of, sort of proactive stuff, like releasing that report, a lot of social media, of course, but also very really targeted stuff. Like we've done a series of webinars about different issues um, aimed mainly towards public officials and reporters so that by the time something comes up or mid amp comes to them, we've already explained the issue to them. And so instead of them automatically taking mid amps word for it, they've um, heard the, the other side, the true side, of this. So uh, a lot of it's targeted and then a lot of it's just general like, you know, billboards and demonstrations in front of their headquarters and that kind of stuff. Um, so then finally, the uh, my last slide, please. So let me just kind of quickly wrap up, like what, what are the elements of this kind of strategy? Um, and the next line. So one is like really important, like figure out who the decider is in the company. Maybe the CEO, maybe the chairman, maybe something completely different. But it's, it took us a while because Berkshire Hathaway is such a monster of a company to figure out who it is that we need to focus on. Uh, next, please. Do the power map. And again, we're about to hear about that, but let's skip to the next one. Uh, build a coalition. This has been critical. Often we got like our own issue that's like really important to us and it is really important, but we need to think, how do we connect that? Um, and I was listening to a podcast the other day, a podcast called Practical Radicals. They talked about all these different groups in Minneapolis that all realized their problems with this housing, public services, you know, payment for janitors, it all goes back to like two companies in Minnesota that dominated that place. They could like figure out what's the coalition if you go higher up enough you'll sort of find under that umbrella, there's a lot of different groups with lots of different issues that you can work with. Next, please. Um, and then, as I said earlier, you know, run on it, issues that affect them. I mean, often we like really go big on our issues and they are, again, they're important, but we need to think about what ones really move the company, not just, um, and, you know, it may be something completely irrelevant to us, but something that can really make them miserable. Um, again, like, you know, stopping that capital expansion that Mid-Am wanted to do. 
Uh, and then the next one. Um, and persistence. Um, you know, we really need to like keep going, keep going. Um, these take a while, and, and corporate campaigns are often kind of frustrating because it, you know, it's a few months before the company even acknowledges you're out there. Um, and I, I can only say that's true. This is this is hard. It takes a long time, but it took a long time to get into this mess. And you know, no other strategy provides quick fixes anyhow. So um, it's not like you know, there's some strategy to turn uh, Iowa into a blue state where there'll be a governor and legislature that's um, going to solve all these problems. You know, anything we do is going to take is going to be hard and take a while. So persistence is really important. And then finally, one last line here is focus. And we uh, this is kind of like the issue thing in terms of our actions. We need to focus on things that move them. And, I, um, and I've done this as much as anybody. We often do actions that, that we like. You know, we'll do something in a park on Saturday afternoon with speeches and face painting. The company doesn't care. We, we've got to, like, figure out where do we show up, where do we intervene, what do we do that creates problems for them, that makes it hard for them to do business, that disrupts their social capital, disrupts their transactions, disrupts their business relationships. You know, be very disciplined about what are you doing it's not because it's and something that will turn out our base or something that's fun. Of course, our actions have to be attractive to people, otherwise they won't participate. But we also have to like have a very, very disciplined eye about what kind of things matter to the company and what are just stuff that is, you know, is, is a nice thing, but it, it didn't really move the needle at all. So um, those are my words of wisdom. Um, I would say for those of you from Red State that are interested in fighting, uh, you know, utilities. This is kind of an obsession of mine. We've been having more and more conversations with people in different places about how we um, come up with different approaches. Uh, I'll put my email in the chat. I'd love to hear from you. Um, and thanks a lot. It's a really good conversation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bill. And yes, please drop your email. If folks want to reach out to Bill, especially around Red State organizing, something critically needed. Thank you for sharing that. Um, okay, great. So we're going to move on to our next presenter, uh, Rob Galbraith. Um, Rob is a senior research analyst at Little Sis and leads their state power mapping camp program, uh, where he provides research and strategic support and partnership with base building organizations, challenging corporate power across the United States. Before joining Little Sis in 2012, uh, Rob focused on energy, finance, and real estate in New York State and Buffalo. Rob currently lives in Buffalo and receives a, received a BA in philosophy and psychology. Uh, so today, Rob is going to be talking about his work on uh, DT against DTE energy, as well as several utilities in New York State. So I'll pass it to you, Rob. Great. Thanks, Candace. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Rob Galbraith. Um, <clears throat> And the organization that I work with is called Little Sis. And I, th I think I saw at the top of the hour some names of some uh, organizations that, that we've worked with in the past. So um, hopefully there, there are some people here are familiar with us. But um, if you're not, Little Sis is a, uh, a, 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 research, a watchdog research organization. And we really focus on, yeah, that what um what bill was talking about uh just before me is and that's that um that research and power mapping and um i think you know we do really deep investigations uh using public resources into um into conflicts of interest into to corporate finance uh corporate structures as well as you know political influence whether that is you know campaign donations lobbying or you know sort of uh the kind of you know, expanding area of, of, of dark money and, and public relations in campaigns. Um, what sets little sis apart from, you know, your basics, uh, your, your basic kind of, um, you know, investigative journalism, uh, outlet is that, um, you know, we are, we, fo we focus on, on corporate power and, and corporate power over, you know, politics and the economy, but we have an explicitly, um, uh, a movement orientation in that 
the research that we do is aimed uh, at supporting organizations, campaigns, and activists that are actively trying to challenge that power. Um, so we we there's kind of three main things that we do at Little Sis. Uh, like I said, we're a research group. We uh, do a lot of you know sort of original research uh, on uh, on corporate power. Um, we have we've two main program areas. Uh, we have a, a, an oil and gas and climate program, uh, and then we have our state power mapping program, which is where I currently work. And in, in, in our state power mapping program, we're really focused on uh, supporting campaigns uh, challenging corporate power at the the state and local level. And you know that that is part of the reason why we have you know over recent years uh, gotten really into. Um, gotten really into challenging uh, the utilities industry uh, because it is so powerful, um, you know, especially at the state and local level. But in addition to to uh, publishing and, and sort of co-producing with, uh, with our partners, this original research, we also do a lot of education, popular education and training. So we, uh, we train, we train organizers and activists in how to do uh, the types of uh, uh, power research uh, into into corporations, into politicians, other powerful people and organizations, um, and um, yeah, we 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 hold sort of both kind of like public trainings as well as you know sort of more individualized trainings, uh, you know, oriented around specific campaigns. Then um, the third kind of prong of what we do at Little Sis is that we we uh, build technology to. Uh, produce and to facilitate uh, the type of research that we're engaged in. So um, our, our kind of our, our flagship site is called littlesys.org. Uh, the idea there is that Little Sis is the opposite of Big Brother. It's a free uh, kind of wiki style research platform where it works like, you know, an in involuntary Facebook or an in involuntary uh, LinkedIn for uh, the 1%. So we, um, you know, we track relationships between powerful people and organizations and, uh, you know, make that available. So if, you know, one person has done a lot of research into, say, you know, a specific utility corporation CEO or, you know, a big bank or something and has put all that research into Little Sis, then the next time somebody, um, you know, is interested in that person or in that corporation, uh, there's all of this research that has already been done. Um, that is all sort of linked back to, uh, you know, reputable sources. So um, it's, 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 yeah, the, the idea there is that it's a way of sort of tracking and following powerful people and organizations and, and, and uh, yeah, again, and keeping us sort of aware of, uh, you know, what, you know, what people, what institutions in their orbit are sort of, you know, helping them maintain their power. Are they working with to, to wield their power? Uh, we also have a tool called Olagrapher, which uh, is uh, basically it's built for um, visualizing and communicating about uh, power, you know, power research and power mapping research. And, and this is, you know, this takes the form of actual, uh, uh, you know, maps, uh, diagrams of networks showing the connections between specific people and organizations uh, within that network. I've got an example of one that I can share uh, in a couple slides from now. But uh, moving on, uh, one of the, the resources that we've developed is this website called powerlines101.org. And this is uh, sort of, it's a research uh, hub for people interested in taking on the utilities industry. Um, there's two kind of big original research projects that we've done uh, on, on the Powerlines website. The first one is called uh, Powerlines 101. And that is really, uh, you know, a guide to, um, a, a guide to, uh, uh, to utility corporations, you know, where, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, how, how they operate, um, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of this was covered by that really uh, excellent video that that Kim showed. So I'm not going to go, you know, into a, a a ton of depth on it. But you know, it the it we talk about uh, you know utility corporations' role in local and regional power structure, um, because th this is one thing why uh, why why utility campaigns are are really important. And I you know I alluded to this before, but um, 
because they have that monopoly right over uh, over really essential infrastructure, over the sort of services that uh, are necessary uh, to live, uh, you know, any kind of like dignified life in the 21st century, that affords them a lot of power. Uh, you know, they if they want to, they can shut off, uh, they can shut off your power, they can shut off your water. Um, and they own the actual the the infrastructure that delivers that and they derive and extract profit, um, you know, through their their sort of enclosure and control of this of this infrastructure. So the the first the first guide is really sort of you know breaking down um, you know how the utilities industry works, what its role is in you know not just um, yeah you know not just the climate fight, but um, because of its you know because of this kind of centrality for you know electricity, cooking fuel, heating fuel to uh, to life. Um, um, you know, ut utility corporations uh, touch on, you know, just tons, uh, tons of areas where people are experiencing, you know, exploitation and extraction. Uh, you know, your utility bills are part of your housing costs, right? Um, you know, the utility companies are deeply insinuated into, um, into organizations like uh, chambers of commerce, which are then, you know, really active in state and local politics, um, you know, fighting, fighting against environmental regulation, um, you know, fighting against workers' rights, uh, uh, you know, fighting against, you know, anything to anything to protect consumers. And, and you know, basically they're, you know, explicit, you know, they're oriented around uh, map maximum uh, profit uh, extraction and, and accumulation and utility corporations play, you know, are really sort of key nodes um, in these chambers of commerce, which also tend to include, you know, the major local banks, major local law firms, and then whatever sort of industries are, are dominating in a, in a certain area. The, the second piece uh, of original research and, and the power lines guide is is a guide that we created to challenging uh, electric utility rate hikes. And um, we decided to produce this because, um, you know, for one thing, we, you know, we identified utilities as being, you know, really important corporations to, for people to be examining the, the role that they play in their lives and, and, and challenging their power, fighting back against that power. Um, and, we felt like uh, these rate cases are really great uh, opportunities for organized people to flex power against, um, you know, these these utility corporations, which in pretty much every other area, they're used to being the uh, the dominant force. But the thing is, uh, because these rate cases happen, it, you know, kind of behind closed doors and very sort of tightly constrained uh, environments where uh, utility co utility corporation um, money and power allows them to bring in you know huge teams of lawyers, huge teams of experts. Uh, they're you know they're talking to an audience of you know utility regulators who they're you know in front of all the time and, and enjoy really close relationships with. In fact, many of these uh, regulators you know have passed into a uh, regulation through uh, the revolving door coming from the utilities industry themselves. Uh, we have to get sort of creative and creative about how, uh, you know, how we can fight back uh, against rate hikes and other proceedings, uh, at utility regulators. So that's why we, we produced this, uh, this power lines 102 guide to challenging electric utility rate hikes. And that the whole, um, that whole report is about how you can, um, you know, intervene in a rate case, uh, how you can use the rate case process to, again, to sort of make trouble for the utility corporation. You know, maybe you're, uh, you know, getting towards, you know, something that, that Bill was talking about, you know, maybe your campaign isn't strictly about, you know, um, uh, how much how much people are, are paying for energy, um, but it is a great opportunity to, again, to, to make trouble for the utility corporations. Um, it's also a really great opportunity uh, on ramp and organizing opportunity because this is an issue that is you know so deeply felt by just every single person um you know no matter if, if you're a homeowner or a renter you know everybody has to pay uh the power bill when it comes in everyone has to pay the gas bill when it comes in and um and it's you know and and nobody likes doing it everybody feels like they're getting ripped off um, and, uh, you know, usually, usually they are, um, 
and so um, you know, we, we tried to sort of bridge the gap between this, you know, really excellent sort of on-ramp to campaigning against utility corporations um, and the sort of, you know, almost mystical process that happens at utility regulators in determining these rate cases. And so in there, we talk about, you know, actions that, you know, non-experts, non-attorneys can, can do in, in rate cases uh, as well as, uh, you know, strategies for taking the fight against utility companies outside of that really constrained uh, boardroom type environment uh, by, um, you know, bringing attention to uh, uh, utility comp like how much the whole company is is profiting, bringing attention to the, you know, huge pay packages for the executives at these companies, bringing attention to like, what are the sort of larger effects of uh, burning fossil fuels uh, on our, you know, on our communities and, and our, and our world, um, you know, within, uh, within a rate case proceeding, uh, you know, you're generally not allowed to bring those things up or, or you're, you're, you'll, you'll be told that, you know, the judge is not, you know, really going to be considering these things. We're only looking at the sort of the facts on the ground, but by bringing the fight outside of, outside of that room by, you know, uh, per, by researching the company, by, uh, by publicizing, you know, some of this other, you know, really relevant information, whether it's in letters to the editor or op-ed columns, public reports, popular education sessions, uh, you know, we can we can use that to sort of build a lot of pressure uh, against not just the company, but against these uh, these regulators who, you know, for the most part, they're used to people ignoring them. They're used to all this happening sort of quietly behind closed doors. And what we found is that when people, uh, you know, put a little uh, energy and emphasis into sort of organizing around rate cases, uh, we can often win really big victories against the utility company while also sort of, you know, introducing uh, a counter narrative to what they have to say about, uh, you know, how important it is to, to keep us, uh, you know, burning gas forever. So um, on the next slide, I'm going to start talking about uh, one one campaign that that we worked on with uh, a couple organizations in Michigan uh, doing just that. Um, this uh, this was a campaign, um, or this piece of this campaign happened in uh, 2022 uh, when the DTE Energy, the a gas and electric utility serving Southeast Michigan, was seeking a, a massive rate hike on its uh, on you know this the the captive customers of, of its monopoly. Um, now, the organizations that that uh, we partnered with, uh, We the People Michigan and Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition, um, they they've been they are sort of engaged in a longer term campaign, uh, tar you know trying to take down uh, DTE Energy, its its uh, you know political power, um, and uh, you know and really rethink what the energy system looks like. They are you know. They're organizing to build a clean and democratically owned and controlled energy system for Michigan. Um, but uh, when DTE came around, uh, you know, with seeking this you know huge, huge, huge rate hike, um, they recognized this as an opportunity to to get people organized against DTE um, because, uh, and I think this is uh, this is something that uh, I, uh, Kim mentioned that I think is really important is that. When uh, they want, because they have, they've, they're granted these monopolies, when they want to raise prices, they have to come asking for something. And anytime a corporation has, is coming and asking for something, this is a moment where we can insert ourselves into the conversation and say, wait, maybe not. <laughs> um, let, let's, uh, let, let's think about this. Let, and, and maybe we won't, uh, you know, you are asking for something, but you have to, you know, demonstrate that uh that you know you 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 need this or you deserve it or you've earned it and this is uh and this is an opportunity to really sort of uh you know insert ourselves kind of drive a wedge between this you know uh regulatory apparatus and you know wealth extraction apparatus that are used to working very closely together hand in hand but you know when they are asking for something um this is an opportunity to kind of Get between them and start talking about uh, what what we want and what we're demanding instead. Um, so the first uh, really really big thing that that they did here in this campaign was that they uh, they 
petition for and won a public hearing on the the rate hike that DTE was asking for. And this was the first time that the Michigan Public Service Commission, the uh, the utilities regulator in that state, had ever done this. So that in itself was, you know, a really big win. And sort of in the run up to this uh, public hearing that was held in Detroit, um, we worked with We the People and with uh, Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition uh, on this report that we called the public public's case against DTE Energy. And we really sort of, you know, took uh, inspiration from the fact that they were operating in this kind of, you know, quasi judicial uh, um procedure where they're asking for a rate hike and evidence is is considered and everything. And, uh, you know, we took the opportunity to present our evidence uh, about, you know, not not just why DTE shouldn't be, you know, allowed to to suck all this money out of uh, Michiganders, but, you know, why, um, you know, why, why we need to have, uh, uh, you know, publicly owned and operated uh, uh, clean energy utilities uh, that serve the people rather than shareholders. Um, so we put together this report um, where uh, we, the people and Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition compiled huge amounts of information on uh, just how poor the service from DTE Energy was, looking at the huge number of power outages they had, looking at the the uh, number of shutoffs. I think DTE is still the uh, the utility company that that shuts off uh, pow power for the for uh, the most people. Um, and also looked at uh, a lot of the the environmental harms that uh, DTE's operations they uh, they they're a, they're a gas and electric utility so they're operating you know fossil fuel power plants they're piping gas into people's homes um, and they uh, you know pr pr produced a huge amount of information on the the harms uh, that that DTE was inflicting that you know were costing people money in addition to uh, the the bills that they had to pay to DTE. Um, the part of this that that we contributed to a little sis was this uh, was a power mapping. And we um, again, we we looked at the you know huge amount, huge millions of dollars that DTE had spent on uh, political donations um, <clears throat> as well as on lobbying. Uh, we found that they had donated to, I think, something like uh, like eighty six percent of the members of the legislature. Um, they spent millions of dollars on lobbying. They operated, um, uh, you know, a, a network of dark money front groups where they were, you know, pumping money into these, uh, you know, very anonymous sounding 501c4 organizations that were then just, you know, spewing money all across the state on ads, um, you know, opposing clean energy on, uh, on, on donations to uh, politicians, various committees. And um <clears throat> So we, we, yeah, we put together this report and then uh, we had a big, uh, there was a big public event right in front of DTE's headquarters uh, where, uh, you know, speakers talked about how they'd be impacted by the, by the rate hike, talked about, um, talked about the, uh, uh, you know, the, the environmental harms and harms to democracy. They even got um, uh, uh, Congress member Rashida Tlaib to come out and speak at that. And then, you know, after that, building on that momentum, mobilized hundreds of people to speak out against the uh, the utility at this rate hike hearing. The ultimate result of that was that uh, the PSC reduced DTE's rate hike by something like 90 percent, you know, saving, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for people in Michigan. And again, you know, building momentum, uh, you know, for this campaign to take a larger look and reevaluate and change uh, how DTE shows up um, in society. Go to the next slide. I'll talk briefly about some of the work that we've done in New York. This here on the bottom corner is one of the, the power maps that I was talking about. Um, this is a power map of a front group called New Yorkers for Affordable Energy that emerged uh, to try to... Uh, jam up the implementation of New York's climate law. Um, <clears throat> this was part of a report that we did that showed really how the whole utilities industry sort of statewide was contributing to this uh, um, to this propaganda effort to try to uh, to to try to uh, block um, uh, New, uh, New York's energy transition. Uh, this was kind of just one one uh, ask one sort of lane that we took some of this utilities work. But we've also worked with organizers uh, and through uh, the Public Service Commission processes uh, to we've reformed a, a national fuels uh, energy conservation program to get them to spend more money 
on uh, home weatherization. Uh, we've uh, fought back rate hikes, and we uh, we managed to to get them to divert uh, almost two million dollars in excess earnings uh, again to uh, to fund weatherization. Um, I kind of I kind of rushed through that because I, I I took my time a little bit with the Michigan stuff. So happy to answer any other questions folks have about that in the Q and A. But I think I'm about to kick it back to Candace now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rob. And that was perfect. Thank you. Um, but yes, we will go ahead and set aside some time for questions. Just one second. Awesome. Um, so once again, thank you to Kim and, and Michael and Bill and Rob uh, for sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom. Um, do folks have any questions that they would like to ask? Um, let me just change the permissions here so that folks come off mute. And if you, if someone's asking a question and uh, you have something that you want to ask afterwards, just like put a little asterisk in the chat and we'll make sure that uh, you're next in the queue. But whoever has a question first for any of these lovely presenters, feel free to come off mute and shout it out. I know it's a lot of information. I'd love to ask a question. Okay. Um, just in general, when you're doing these wonderful things and getting these amazing um, movements started and then gathering momentum from it, what do you think is the best way to do that? Um, I know it's a general question, but you know, I think one of the biggest problems is, is that there's um, it's really hard to get people to get away from their everyday regular life and start to show, uh, start to get them involved and get them passionate about what obviously everyone on this call is passionate about. What have you guys found, and anybody could answer this, I guess, that works the best as far as getting people motivated and getting them up off their couches, so to speak? Oh, it looks like Kim has her hand up first. Yeah, I would say, um money. <laughs> People don't want high bills. Um, they also get really pissed off when they know that corporations are swindling them and their bills are going up. So I would say like that has been a clincher to get everybody sort of involved that might not have, it might be like, you know, a gateway to getting them involved in, you know, more inter you know, intersecting issues to economics. But I would say like, we've been really successful about pissing people getting pissed off at, at corporations for swindling their money. Also, Michael. Yeah, it's a great question <laughs> because there's so much to do. Um, I would say, um, you know, I, the first thing is definitely sort of finding people's feelings and anger about all of this is, is the starting point. Um, there's a saying sometimes in the labor movement that apathy isn't real. And I think that's true. It's that people really do care deeply, but there, there's just so much they have to deal with day to day that we have to find that. Um, and the second small point I would make is from there, I think we really have to show people that we have a plan to win. Um, because people have limited time in their day, as you said, they have a lot of responsibilities in their lives. And so we need to help them see that if they step up and take action, there's going to be a real impact. Awesome. Any more feedback to that first question from our presenters? And also, yeah, I'll just offer up, you know, of course, there's always the, you know, the standard sort of like ladder of engagement, right? Like there's certain things that some people just can't do, you know, some people cannot do direct action. Some people, you know, may not want to dive into like the full policy piece, but they might be really excited about, you know, helping share their story on social media or, you know, helping you like write a petition or something like that, um, you know, that might be like lower risk. So I think it's also like, creating that scale for folks so that it feels more tangible and more sustainable for people. And you build a, a stronger ecosystem that way as well. That's just more general. Um, yes, 
It is a big question. Um, and let's see here, just going back through here. Looks like Jeff hopped in and answered this question, but just to voice it out, um, Andrew Hens uh, asked in the chat, is there a way to connect all these fights, these state fights in order to push for action at the federal level? And what would be the low hanging fruit for a coalition targeting reform at the federal level? It's a super clear question. Uh, Jeff is saying, our North America director, um, that uh, federal legislation is really hard right now. Two things we are trying to figure out is um, our national corporate targets, federal legislation that has been introduced to stop utilities and uh, using our money to a uh, lobby. Um, are there any other thoughts around that? As I'm sure there's been some thinking amongst your circles about like how to elevate this on a federal level, Kim? Yeah, I would say I mean, yeah. um, in, before elevating it to a federal law, um, I think what has been really successful with us is that we are talking with other states because the utility commissions are so uh, centralized into state, very strict state regulated goals or goal laws. Um, and what we've been able to do is work with um, folks like Itai Vardy, who has helped us like learn about um, different ways that they've pat that he's been help working with different organizers in different states to pass legislation that prevents corporate utilities from using our money to lobby in their interests. And so we're copying and pasting that that sort of law in each state and we're just staying in touch. And I put one of the links to the to the legislation for New York in the in the chat. But like we've been chit chatting with people in California and in, in the Northwest and in the South who have been able to successfully introduce or pass these laws and we're just keeping each other posted. So um, it doesn't always have to be like a like an umbrella. It can always be like a sort of the, the shape of like, you know, maybe like ants all working together to do one thing. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Um, Go ahead, Brad. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I, I would, I would add to that. I mean, I think, I think one area where I think, you know, national level organization could, can, could really play, play a role in in the fight against utilities specifically is, um, around, uh, appointments to, to the federal energy regulatory commission, the, the it's called or FERC, which is the sort of national, uh, utilities regulator that is really involved in, um, approving a lot of the, the pipeline projects and stuff that utility companies, um, depend on, you know, especially these uh, interstate ones. Um, I think I think that's like one area where um, you're not going to you're not going to be, you know, as much coming against coming up against sort of like congressional gridlock. Um, and and that that's that's an area where I, I think there is some sort of energy building around that. But, you know, the the federal energy regulator is just as sort of industry tied as any state one. And I think that that is and that there's an interesting possibility there. All right, thank you, Rob. Any other responses here? Okay, Duncan, you had your hand up for a minute. Go ahead. Yes, uh, so I guess this question maybe for Bill Reagan. <clears throat> you spoke about talking about what moves other people, not what moves you. So I wanted to ask you about this so somewhat wonky idea that moves me and to see whether people, you know, people you know, would, who you're trying to move would respond to it, which is from uh, Gene Sharp's view of power, which I think probably all of you know, or versions of it, which is that there's a monolithic view of power where it's just somehow power is somebody has it and then dispenses it. And then there's a social view of power, which is actually nobody has power. Power comes out of a network of relationships of consent and those relationships can be disrupted. So when you talk to, that's a very optimistic view. It, it keeps me going, but I'm wondering whether who would who would move be moved by that argument besides people who read a lot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's uh, yeah. I wouldn't go into the theoretical framework about the seven different kinds of power. Uh, in a you know a meeting, but I would say like have a discussion. Um, and I, you know, let me go back to my janitor days. We start every meeting with say, okay, 
who's making you miserable? Well, it's my boss. You know, it's some guy that works at the janitor company. Well, you know, who's allowing him to do that? Well, it's, you know, it's his boss at the janitor company. And then it's the building manager. And it's like, everybody's like mad at their boss right in front of him. We'd have a conversation that would go up to like, who owns the building? Because that's the person that really allows this to happen, that profits from it. And, okay, well, that's good. Now they have a better analysis. But then we'd have to come up with a plan. Like, well, if it's some, you know, corporation based in Hong Kong, really not much we can do. Um, but if it's, a, you know, if it's a real estate company that has a lot of money invested by public pensions or by a big bank or something like that, we can figure out, like, okay, let's, you know, let's go do something in the lobby of that bank. Let's go um, talk to the union that represents the people in this pension plan. It's like sort of figuring out a route to that power because you know, power is like it's always in flux. It's based on relationships. It's you know, it can be given and taken away. Of. It's like can you come up with like an intervention point? And it's not going to be like a magic bullet, but um, you know, can you keep like hammering away and start like breaking the the chains or whatever you know the whatever the right term is that that keeps this company powerful? Can you like? clip away at that and, and, you know, find those points of intervention in a way that people understand. So if you like, I think FERC is really important. I, I've been arrested in front of FERC. Um, so there's no question that that's a good target. But I think if you're having a meeting with some folks in Detroit, I wouldn't start talking about federal energy regulatory policy. I would like to talk about, you know, what's happening in their city and their state. Awesome. Thank you for that, Bill. Um, we could take a couple more questions. You can drop it in the chat or you can come off mute. Going once. Mm -hmm. Going twice. Okay. It's dinner time. I get it. Okay. Uh, oh, Elizabeth. Hey, Elizabeth. Okay, go ahead. Hey, uh, Candace, I just wanted to say hi. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for putting this together. And all. Uh oh. Uh, your your yeah. sound went out. Is it bad? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say, yeah, thank you very much to you and all the panelists. This was a lot of fun and a lot of really good information. Um, we're fighting a few fights down here in New Orleans and Louisiana around this. So it's it's good to have some great inspiration. And yeah, thanks so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yes, I have things to talk to you about in New Orleans, so we will be in touch. Um, Awesome. Well, thank you guys for joining us, first and foremost. I know it's dinner time, so uh, really, really appreciate making that space. Um, and to our panelists, uh, yeah, Kim and Bill and Michael and Rob, thank you all so much for sharing your knowledge and wisdom tonight. Um, I'm just going to pull up the slides again for next steps for those who are visual, and we'll drop some links in the chat as well. Just one second. Uh, okay. All right. And y'all miss my really fun Fresh Pence gif with the questions and it's fine, but I just wanted to show it to you. Anyway, um, so just to let you guys know about some upcoming sessions that um, will happen again, this is like a free series. So please like let your friends know, feel free to participate, anything that, that interests you. So Coming up on May 23rd, um, our network council, which is made up of uh, some of our, our top local groups uh, within 350's US ecosystem, um, will uh, be doing a teach-in about some of their top utilities campaigns. So we definitely encourage you guys to join that. We'll be emailing out that information as well. And then on the 28th, and uh, there were a couple of presentations that tapped on this, but just specifically about targeting uh, public utilities commissions and what that work can look like. Then we're gonna be doing some power mapping. I know little sis is coming back for that, which is great, woo! Can't get rid of y'all. And uh, some campaign research as well. So it'll be a deep dive into those strategies. Um, so if you're curious about, you know, like where to start or what to do, this is a great opportunity. 
Um, we will be doing a training that was very successful with our 350 local groups um, about IRA direct pay. I know it's super wonky, even for the wonkiest of us. So like, I hope that, you know, this is an opportunity for you guys to have, have it kind of de-wonkified, demystified, and actually be able to apply so you can utilize this. Um, and then we are aiming for a trivia night and celebration. So folks who've been a part of this journey with us, we want to have like a fun, you know, uh, wonky best of uh, utilities, um, just kind of a summation of like all the sessions that we've had and a celebration of the folks who joined us on this journey. Um, I also want to say lensing out after the 18th, we'll be taking a two week break. And then we're going to be starting a new series about narrative work, storytelling, digital act activations, and like how you can use those tools. So we'd love for you guys to join us for that. And also Yanni, who's on our call, um, will be hosting uh, something in the fall um, about U.S. territories and the impact of colonization on uh, our U.S. territories and utilities. So we'd love for you guys to be a part of that as well. Once again, these are all free, so please continue to join us. If you're not able to make it, don't feel bad. We're always going to send out recordings of the sessions. And yeah, that's essentially it. If you want, feel free to join our volunteer Slack. Um, it's just, you know, a space in Slack. I don't know how many Slacks you guys are in, but it's an area where, you know, any of our volunteers and local groups are able to kind of talk to each other, see what other people are working on, uh, a lift campaigns. If you want to invite a friend to this uh, session, um, we'll put the link in the chat. Just feel free to share it out with your people so they can get registered. And we also have an emerging campaign called Our Own Power. Um, you can click on the link for the toolkit, but it's essentially like a starter guide on what it would look like for you to start your own community run renewables. So definitely take a look at that. It was something that we uplifted and focused on a lot in our last session, but would love for folks to just, you know, start to poke around and see what this looks like. No pressure. Um, but thank you all so much for being here and have a great evening. Hopefully see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Good night.